and we have been in a series this semester on listening carefully to Jesus. It, we've, we've tried to sort of flood the campus with, uh, whoop, with uh, the words of Jesus and get us all just kind of thinking and in conversation about the things that Jesus said, because we have a conviction that it really is Jesus' words and his actions that have been the most influential, most life-changing uh, words and actions that have ever happened on this planet. They're still working out the implications 2,000 years later. Uh, he's just that amazing. And so we've just been reflecting week to week on... Um, uh, you know, what did Jesus have to say about different things and how can we sort of take that into account? So I'm going to start us with a prayer and then we'll launch in here. God, I just pray that we would hear clearly tonight. I pray that your spirit would speak and I pray that, um, that each one of us would be uh, attuned to what it is that you want to say to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so I want to start with two stories <clears throat> from my high school experience about confessing sin. Um, yeah, here we go. Um, the first one is just kind of a story of my youth group. I grew up in uh, my, my teen years in like a really big church, and it was kind of, you know, we, we dressed up and... Um, Church was really serious. Like if we were kind of the, you know, the rebellious teenagers that Sunday, we might clap, you know, during one of the songs or something like that. It was just a pretty serious, but, and I don't say that to, to um, denigrate my church, but just to say like, this is, it was a formal, uh, serious kind of church upbringing. And my youth group was pretty large. And I think there were a lot of people that took their faith pretty seriously. Uh, I certainly learned a lot about God's word and uh, was taught to read the scripture and think about the scripture there. But I remember us, whenever we would uh, come to the topic of confession of sin, you know, it comes up in the scripture sometimes. And then we would like, okay, now it's time. Like we're going to try to confess our sin. It was just amazing because the only sin I ever heard confessed through years of youth group was pride. That was like the socially acceptable sin to confess. Like, and so you'd be going around, you know, the circle and it's like, oh, me too, pride. I don't know. I haven't struggled with anything else this whole week. I mean, the real pride was the fact that we wouldn't confess any real sin, you know, but we didn't talk about that. That was not the pride we were talking about. It was just, we had this kind of spiritual pride that we, uh, that we confessed nonstop. I don't know. And, um, you know, I, I know that as a side note, I did get to confess some real sin with some of those friends after I graduated, that summer after I graduated, and it was a, a huge catalyst for spiritual growth in my life, and, uh, and, and you started finding out what was really going on in our youth group and in our lives, and, and it was everything you would expect, and maybe some things you wouldn't expect um, that were going on, and, and I think that moment of kind of moving beyond confessing pride with my friends and the people around me uh, was, was a, a turning point in my life. I don't think I would have ever gone into uh, a life of ministry. And I don't mean that vocationally. I just mean that relationally. It's like, I don't think I would be living my life as a minister to the people around me um, without that night of sitting with some friends and, and getting real about what was going on in my life, in my heart. Um, I think I would have been another good little church man, grown up from a good little church boy, you know, and, and doing that deal. And so, uh, you know, confession came later, but in my youth group, we just talked about pride. Second story, this one's really embarrassing. Um, so I remember, you know, I'm, I'm a different generation. Um, I'm kind of out between uh, Gen X and the millennials in age. And so I'm not really a part of one of those. Um, and, and they kind of define my little micro generation by people that sort of got the internet or, you know, uh, a cell phone, that kind of stuff, like late high school or college. Like we grew up our entire lives without those things. And then more as we were entering adulthood, they hit us. 
So I remember us getting uh, the internet. I mean, I don't even know what it was. It was probably like AOL or CompuServe or things you don't really know about. Um, but some version of the internet in our house when I was, I think, 16, 17. And as a red-blooded American boy, one of the first things I went looking for was pornography. And, um, and I was very curious. I mean, because again, there was no access to that my entire growing up. And so I, <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking, but I somehow found this, and it was very difficult to find at the time, or more difficult than it is now. And so I, with pen and paper, wrote down <laughs> the website that I had found this on. And then, being like a dumb boy, left it there, like at the family computer. <laughs> So then, so then, <laughs> I know, so, so then my father comes <clears throat> and is like, hey, <laughs> piece of paper, you know, he's like, hey, what is this? And being like the brilliant liar, I was like, oh yeah, I, <laughs> I don't remember, it was something like I wrote that down so I wouldn't go back to <laughs> or like so I could block it, I don't know what my... <laughs> It was like a bad, bad lie. And, um, and my father, so gracious, was like, okay, like I'll take you at face value and that that was what you're doing. And so I remember <laughs> lying in bed that night <clears throat> and I think I had just recently been reading Hebrews um, 11 and 12. And in, in Hebrews 12, uh, the writer just says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time. It's painful. Later on, however, there's a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. So strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees so that the lame won't be disabled, but rather healed. And I just remember laying in my bed and like that scripture running through my mind, you know, for a couple of hours as I like debated with myself of like, okay, am I going to go wake my father up in the middle of the night and tell him the truth or not? And I just felt myself at, at a crossroads. And so I did, I woke him up and, and he was very gracious. And I mean, he had to have known I was lying. I mean, there's just like, he's not a stupid man. I was a stupid boy, but he is not a stupid man. Um, but he responded with, with a lot of grace and it, and it was a turning point. And so I'm going to, I'll refer back to those in a minute, but I just want to remind us we're talking last week and this week about listening carefully to Jesus about sin. And last week we saw how when Jesus talked about sin, he really didn't let anyone off the hook. In fact, our, our point that we reflected on was that Jesus closed all the loopholes and then he pointed the finger directly at our hearts. He closed the loopholes and he pointed the finger at our hearts. That when it comes to sin, we don't get to blame anyone else. We need to look inside of ourselves to find the problem. From within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts and sexual morality and greed and all of these different things we saw in Mark 7. And we do like to blame other people for all the things that we do wrong. I mean, it's almost like a cultural trope now that we blame our parents, you know, and, and we like to blame other groups, you know, whether that's other racial or ethnic groups or other, other socioeconomic groups or whatever it is. We're just constantly looking for who we can pin the blame on so that we're really perfect and righteous and anything we did wrong was actually just their fault. But Jesus doesn't let anyone off the hook. Except maybe kids. He does kind of at, at times sort of imply like, yeah, the kingdom belongs to, you got to become like them, right? So tonight our question is not so much what Jesus said about sin because he was uncompromising on that. In fact, he, he didn't lower the standards of sin. He raised the standards. You've heard it was said, but I'm telling you if that's going on in your heart, you've already sinned, Right? Tonight, our question is, how did Jesus treat and talk to sinners? What did Jesus have to say about people caught up in sin? 
And so I want to start in Luke 5. If you've got a Bible or a phone, I encourage you to to pull it up. But I want to start in Luke 5. And this was a challenging one because we're going to look more, because of the nature of it, we're going to look more at stories tonight. Jesus says things in these stories, but these aren't just blocks of teaching. Because we want to see how he actually spoke to people caught up in sin. And these, I I had to just sort of pick some passages because there's a lot of these. So Luke 5, 29. Let's see, 29. Then Levi, who's a tax collector, held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You know, there's been a lot made that these tax collectors are kind of considered the the worst of the worst, uh, that they weren't just, you know, traitors to their country, but they were thieves. They were people that had really rejected God and his word and his people. And here we just sort of see Jesus hanging out with them. And so the first thing that I see about how did Jesus treat and talk to sinners is that he came for sinners. That's who he was drawn to. That's who he went to. In Luke 19, a little later, when he's eating at a different tax collector's house, he makes the comment in 1910, he says, I came to seek and save what was lost. That's why he came. So Jesus was willing to eat with sinners. He was willing to hang out with sinners. He makes it his point that he didn't come, you know, to try to find the most righteous people that he could find because he knew that wasn't where the need was, that he was drawn to the need. The second thing I see is that Jesus defended sinners from The judgment of others, often. John 8, that's the passage that um, Josiah read for us earlier. So if you want to go over there, John 8, and it starts at the beginning of of the chapter in verse 2. We have this story of this woman caught in adultery, right? At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Again, sometimes we're just caught in the act. I was caught in the act of, you know, having handwritten my website. (laughs) In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? And it says they were using this as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. You know, and the trap here seems to be that, um, you know, if Jesus says like, no, don't stone him, then he's like, oh, I'm, a- I'm against the Bible. I'm against God's word. And they have a way to accuse him. But if he says stoner, stoning people was actually illegal. They were not their own government. They were under the Roman government. And so they could go to the authorities and say, this, this man got this woman killed. And so he's, you know, they're trying to trap him. It says, but Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And people, you know, there's been a, a million thoughts of like, what was he writing and what did he do? And, but it's interesting because he actually writes twice on the ground with his fingers, right? He bends down, uh, he stands up, and then he again, he stoops down and writes again. And, and, and some people think this is that he's probably writing the Ten Commandments, because when God writes the Ten Commandments, you know, he writes them once on tablets of stone, and then Moses breaks those, and so God rewrites them on tablets of stone again. So here we have Jesus writing in the earth two times. So he's probably writing these, here's, here's the rules, you know, but we don't know for sure. But his words, let any of you who's without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. <clears throat> this is a very creative way of defending her, right? He protects her life. And we could tell other stories. I was thinking, uh, if you go over 
uh, look in Luke 7. You know, there's the story of the, the woman that the scripture just says she lived a very sinful life in that town. And Jesus is at dinner with some, you know, important religious person. And she comes in and is weeping and washing his feet and wiping it with her hair. And they're like, wow, if this guy was really a prophet, he would know, you know, that this is a sinful woman. And he says, let me tell you something. You know, he's like, let me, let me tell you, when I came in, you did not treat me like a good host at all. And yet this woman who you look down on has been the host to me that you weren't. And he basically just says, you know, she has, she loves much because she's been forgiven much and you love little because you've been forgiven little. And, and he just exposed all of this. There's another scene very similarly where a different woman breaks this expensive jar of perfume over his feet. And they're all, oh, she should have, she should have sold that and given to the poor. I mean, the most self-righteous. And one of them, Judas, who's stealing from the money they give to the poor. You know, oh, she should have sold that, given to the poor. And Jesus just says, wherever my story is told, we'll tell the story of that woman. And we tell the story of those people who criticized her too. They got remembered. And she got remembered. He defended people from the judgment of others. And at the end of this story, he straightens up and asks her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir. Then neither do I. Neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. See, Jesus was qualified to throw stones, but he didn't. But he always invites people into a new way of life. He always invites people into a new way of life, and we see that in this story. It ends, go now and leave your life of sin. It sort of echoes earlier in John, in John 5, uh, he heals this lame man, and he ends, he says, stop sinning or something worse may happen. You know, that he, he pulls people and points them in a new direction. And so we see that love does not equal permissiveness. That's not what he's doing here. In fact, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me. If you love me, you'll obey me. We've redefined love so often in our culture that it's like, love means you approve of everything I do. Love means you tell me I'm wonderful all the time. Love means you blame everyone else but me. And let me blame everyone else but me. Jesus didn't engage in any of that. But he did defend people and he did invite them into a new way of life. He responded to this woman much like my dad did in the story I told earlier. With grace and acceptance. With truth, but also with a warning. With love. You know, fourth, he taught people to take sin very seriously. Let's look at Matthew 18. This one's short, but Matthew 18, 8. And this is a teaching that's echoed a few times through the Gospels, even more than once in Matthew. I'm going to take this one out of context of of the story just to see it. But last week, we had talked about this woe because of things that cause people to sin, but, or, you know, such things have to come, but woe to the person through whom they come. But then he goes on, he says, if your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. He teaches this idea of radical amputation, That sin is like a cancer in us. It has to be removed. And if it's grown so much in some part of you that it can't be extricated, you'd be better off without that part of you. Sin is a big deal. Jesus did not hesitate to teach what was right just to spare people's feelings. Because sin was too big of a deal. It's like a disease that we don't want to talk about. We don't want to warn people about In John 8, back in John 8, a little bit later in the same passage, down in 31, 
It says, to the Jews who had believed him. So these are the ones that are actually listening and buying in, right? Not, not his opponents. He says, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. And then you'll know the truth. And the truth will set you free. And they're kind of offended by this, right? They answered him, we're Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we'll be set free? And Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Sin is slavery. Sin is the big deal. It's our real problem. And Jesus calls everyone to repent, to change, to turn around, to go in a new direction. And so he has this balance of incredible grace, but also being uncompromising in what he believes to be true and what he's teaching them. In responding to sinners like this, Jesus surprised people. He was not what they were used to from their rabbis. He wasn't what they thought God was like. He taught the truth without compromise, but with great acceptance and grace. He lets us come as we are. But it's that acceptance that transforms us. See, that's the amazing thing about the gospel, that God's plan for you is not to leave you like you are. It is the most radical transformation of your life and heart and character and mind imaginable. And his methodology is the most radical acceptance of you right where you are right now. It's this paradox. It's this mystery of like, how does that work? Jesus does this thing throughout his ministry. We looked at it last week when the guy walks, you know, he's coming in, he's being lowered down, he's lame, and Jesus is like, your sins are forgiven. He did not ask for his sins to be forgiven. There's no evidence of repentance. He's coming to Jesus for something else. And Jesus does this. And this was what got him in trouble. The, the religious leaders of the day were not, they were not against forgiving repentant sinners, if someone quit being a tax collector and got it together and started obeying the laws, they'd rejoice, right? But Jesus didn't do it in the right order. He forgave before. He forgave at the first hint that they were coming to him. So he lets us come as we are, and it's his acceptance that transforms us. But there's a mystery in all that. So what we don't see is Jesus going around rebuking sinners. And I think sometimes we, we sort of think like, yes, if we are really committed to God's truth, we are going to have to tell all these people, rebuke the sin, rebuke the sin. You know, I don't know. And, and Paul even kind of, you know, sees the Corinthian churches getting off base in that. He's like, yeah, I, I told you to like do that, but I didn't mean the people of the world. Like that's... Of course they're living in sin. <laughs> because I meant the people in the church. Like, you've got to take care of your own. You've got to take care of your family. But there is one notable exception to Jesus' policy here. One group that Jesus openly calls out, openly rebukes over and over again. And it's these prideful religious people who were more concerned with their own righteousness than with showing grace and love to others. He did have some very harsh words for them. See, that was, that was the, the root of what was going on in my youth group. We were too afraid to be real about what was in our own hearts. We were too concerned with ourselves to see how, you know, my openness might be transformative and life-giving to someone else. I was willing to give God my strengths, but I was not willing to give him my weaknesses and my failures to do with whatever he wanted. Those did not belong to him. I, he, I would give him whatever impressed other people. So the question becomes, does love trump pride in my life? Does love trump pride in your life? The strongest rebuke that we see Jesus give to specific sinners, <clears throat> rather than just teaching about sin, 
I think is in Matthew 23. And there's parallel passages and, and other passages where he's teaching similar things. And this is what Nivi read to us earlier. But I want to read a longer section of it. So if you get to Matthew 23... The scene here is that this is the last week of Jesus' life. He's teaching in the temple. He's got these crowds around him. They've been trying to trap him in his words and do all the stuff that, that they like to do. And at the end of this whole thing, it's sort of his last chance to say what he really thinks. And Jesus really does ramp up to this moment. Um, The first encounters you see Jesus with these religious leaders and Pharisees, this is not how he talks to them. He almost tries to reason with them, right? We saw that. That was Mark's very first encounter was the one we saw last week where they're like, oh, this man must be blaspheming. And he's like, no, so that you know that I do have authority to forgive sin, I'll heal this guy. You know, he's like, look at it. Look at what God is doing. Think through this stuff. And we know it worked with some of them. He does get through to some. We see because they still cause problems in the church when the Pharisees are in the church in in Acts. (laughs) You know, so the, you know, old habits die hard. But they did come to Christ, some. But here he is. And I want you to see what Jesus says in verse 1. Then Jesus said to the crowds and his disciples. So this is not a private rebuke. This is a very public thing. And I think because their sin was very public. Their sin was affecting all of these people. So notice what he says. He says, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you to do or they tell you. So in other words, he's like, you don't get to blame them. Their sin does not excuse anything in your life. You live a life of obedience regardless of their, how fake or false or whatever they are. But do not do what they do. You can listen to their words, but don't be like them. Right? For they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. So these were things they wore, you know, that had to do with their faith and things like that. And they're like, yeah, well, if I'm going to wear something that shows my faith, like this is like, I'm going to have the cross necklace, but it's going to be like the cross necklace, (laughs) you know, whatever that is, I'm going to make sure people see. And he says, and they love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and to be called rabbi by others. But you're not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you're just brothers. And you don't call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he's in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And now he just sort of turns and begins addressing them directly. He's, you know, so all of a sudden we sort of see the scene here. He's talking to his disciples about these people. And now he's, <laughs> they're watching. <laughs> this is public, right? Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Now, an interesting thing here, hypocrites is not a translation. Hypocrites is just a transliteration. This is the Greek word, hypocrite. And it wasn't a Greek word that meant hypocrite. It was just their word for actor. And so this is all he does. Jesus here coins our modern word, hypocrite. He just says, woe to you, you religious leaders, you actors, you thespians. No. (laughs) You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves don't enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you actors, You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you've succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Woe to you blind guides. These are religious leaders, right? Blind guides. You say if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing, but anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath. You blind fools. Which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gift on the altar is bound by that oath. 
you blind men. Which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. Anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and the one who sits on it. We talked about loopholes last week. He's like, you're bound by every word you've spoken. All those lies you told because you said, oh, no, I didn't swear by the right thing. Oh, no, you swore. You swore. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. But you've neglected the more important matters, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You see the sets of three here? <laughs> He's like, you pick spices instead of God's values. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. That was the only part of uh, Andrea's reading. I was like, mosquito. I was like, I bet that's not. So, <laughs> but he's using hyperbole here, right? Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. I mean, this, this is vivid imagery. It's just kind of like, I, I imagine, you know, a cup that it's like someone cleaned the outside, and I'm like pouring some, but it's got like mold and stuff in the bottom of it. He's like, you want to drink out of that? I certainly don't want to. I don't want any part of that. That's not the part that needs to be clean. And if you take care of that, the rest will take care of itself. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. So he's, he's not pulling any punches here. And this is the only group that he does this with, that he doesn't pull any punches with in this way. You know, what is Jesus' real problem here? What, what would you say? Summarizing, what, what's his real problem with these people? How would you summarize it? Attention okay, there's an attention-seeking thing, absolutely. Pride, Pride yeah. Yeah, knowing God, turn away from him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're standing in the way of others getting close to God. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that as teachers, they're held to this stricter judgment. They're having an impact on all these other people, and he has a big issue with that. Someone else had one. Yeah, Chavis. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think and all, all of you are getting at it. I mean, he's kind of circling around the same things. They don't care about the impact that they have on others. They care about themselves. And, and that there's a form of spirituality that looks really righteous, and yet it's not. At the heart, it's corrupt. Remember the scene, uh, if you haven't looked at it lately, Jesus is going, you know, uh, on a boat trip with his disciples and, and he just kind of out of the blue says, beware the yeast of these teachers of the law. And then they're all like, oh my gosh, I think it's because we forgot to bring bread. It's like, I like, they are very dense at times, but you know, I don't know. I don't know what it was like that day. Maybe they were like thinking about the bread a lot. I don't know. But, you know, but, but he's like, no, like this this thing, this thing that's going on in their lives is like yeast. A little bit of it works its way through the whole dough. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it in your own heart. Get rid of it in your own house. It has no place here. It corrupts whatever it touches. See, I would sum up in a large way what we've talked about tonight in a statement that gets repeated over and over, Old and New Testament. 
but I'll reword it a little bit. Jesus opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. It starts in Proverbs 3, 34, where it says God opposes, you know, the, the proud mockers, but gives grace to the humble. And then James repeats that line in his letter, James 4, 6, God opposes the proud, but gives grace or shows favor to the humble. Peter repeats that line in 1 Peter 5, 5. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, I do want to make the point that religious people do not have a monopoly on pride. I have met some incredibly proud sinners. You have to check your own heart. I have to check mine. Are you willing to admit your need and come to him again and again and again? It wasn't every tax collector that hung out with Jesus, only the ones that actually came to the party. Only the ones that invited him over. He was always willing to take the invitation. And it's in reflecting on all of this that Paul would say later in Romans 8, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you come to Jesus, there's no condemnation there. You know, I think Jesus taught this when, have you ever thought about Jesus, you know, in the scene, he's like out teaching and doing all this stuff. Different times people try to kill him or try to force him to be king. Like he never does anything on anyone else's timing. You know, my time hasn't yet come. No, you know, you want to kill me this day? Absolutely not. You know, the one time they're like trying to throw him off a cliff and it just says he walked through the crowd. Like, what did that scene look like? You know, he, he must have been a pretty intimidating guy when he wanted to be. It says when they came to arrest him, they all had swords. And he stepped up and said, here I am. And some of them fell down, fell back. <laughs> you know, it's like there's, you know, he, he's an intimidating guy. But, but he decides when he's going to let them kill him. And when does he do that? When does he go to Jerusalem to set all these things in motion? Passover. He's like, that's the day I'll let you kill me. Because I want you to understand something about who I am and what I'm doing. He didn't just happen to die on Passover. This was a part of his plan. It was a part of God's plan. Because Passover was a celebration of the fact that God's judgment, if they would, you know, follow God's way, if they would trust in God by by slaughtering this lamb and putting its blood on their doorpost, that God's judgment would just pass over them. And Jesus wanted us to understand that I fulfilled this thing. I'm your Passover lamb. See, there's incredible grace here. And it's only those who deny their need for that grace that are in trouble. And how do we do that? Well, we, we deny our need for grace by, one, pretending to be better than we are. And we do that a lot. I think we deny our need, our great need for His grace, when we put everything else ahead of our spiritual growth. As if the real big deal in life, my real problem is my grade on this next test. My real problem is my FOMO over my friends hanging out this weekend without me. You know, my real problem is getting through that next level on the game that I'm playing or that next episode on the show I'm watching. And so we put all this other stuff ahead and what we're telling God is, no, I don't, I don't really need you. I don't need much of that. I've got a lot of things that come on the list before that. And that's the pride that keeps us away from him. We do it when we want to be good enough before we come to him, right? You know, I'll come to Jesus, but only when I'm like worthy enough that he's going to be what, grateful he gets you? I don't know. <laughs> I was thinking about the, the song we sing sometimes. I think we're going to sing it later tonight. Come ye sinners. You know, and it has, the, come ye sinners has this call and response that the, the verses are a, a call from God, and the, the refrain is this response that we have. And, and sometimes I think we, we miss that, that, that one thing where that these are two voices here. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love and power. And then the response, I will arise and go to Jesus. 
he will embrace me in his arms. And in the arms of my dear Savior, there are 10,000 charms. Another verse says, Come ye weary, heavy laden, lost and ruined by the fall. If you tarry, if you wait until you're better, you won't ever come at all. <laughs> no, I will arise and go to Jesus. And that's the invitation. See, Jesus' message is for the worst people. The worst people in prison somewhere. The abusers and the molesters, the third world dictators. Stop comparing yourself to those people and feeling good because I'm, oh, I'm, at least I'm not, I'm a little better. A little better than those bad people, right? It doesn't matter who's worse. All that matters is who comes to Jesus. We aren't here because we're good. We're here because he's good. He's that good. He's that trustworthy. He's that graceful. Have you looked into his eyes and heard, neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. So I give an invitation to you, not to, to come forward, because we're a room full of pastors and brothers and sisters, and certainly you can come to any one of us. You can come talk to me, and sometimes maybe you need to confess something. But you can give yourself to Jesus tonight. You can come to him, whether it's for the first time or the 4,000th and first time. You can come to Jesus tonight. Praise team, you guys can come back up. But I encourage you to hear the call, to see the grace, and to heed the warning that there is for those of us who might be tempted with the yeast of the Pharisees. Don't have anything to do with that. You don't have to be good. He already is. I'll pray for us. God, Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his incredible grace. Thank you for his surprising grace. I pray that we would hear clearly what it is that he wants to say to us tonight and that each one of us would be listening. And I pray that our response would be to arise and go to Jesus again and again and again, trusting that in him there's no condemnation. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.